Um, a very warm welcome to all the panelists and audience um, who have joined us this afternoon. My name is Surabhi and I work with IVH, Initiative for What Works to Advance Women and Girls in the Economy. As part of the Global Evaluation Week 2023, IVH is hosting this panel discussion on understanding gender relations in local culture and context through ethnography, learning challenges and adaptations. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to keep some housekeeping rules. Uh, I request all the panelists to please keep your devices on silent and microphones on mute when you're not speaking. I would also like to request the audience to please drop in your questions in the Q&A box, and I will pick up a couple of questions uh, from there after uh, the discussion. Um, today, I am joined by my colleagues, Ms. Mamita Sarkar, Senior Policy and Program Manager of the Swayam Project at IVH. Along with her, I welcome panelists from Anthropy, Ms. Pratusha Barua, Senior Design Researcher. Anthropy is an anthropological research organization which is conducting the qualitative process evaluation in collaboration with the Swayam Project, IVH. Uh, before we begin, I would like to give a brief overview of IVH. Uh, the initiative for what works to advance women and girls in the economy was set up in 2018. We endeavor to shift base from what to how, what to how to what works. The initiative aims to build on existing research and generate new evidence to inform and facilitate the agenda of women's economic empowerment and to enable synergies between the academics and the research center. Uh, now I would like to request Mamita to please share a brief overview of the SWAM program. Thank you, Survi, for the question. Uh, SWAM stands for Strengthening Women's Institutions for Agency and Empowerment. SWAM serves as a technical assistance and learning partner to National Rural Livelihoods Mission being implemented by the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. The Livelihoods Mission is premised on the principles of social and economic empowerment of rural women across different intersections, collectivized into groups and federations. The estimated current outreach of the program is 80 million rural women across the country. The Livelihoods Mission believes that gender should be mainstreamed in its framework, systems, institutions, and processes. IVG's partnership is thus critical with NRLM through institutionalizing gender across all the levels of the mission. The partnership through SWAM is aimed in ensuring scalability, replicability of strategies like capacity building through standardized evidence-backed modules to staff and cadres, establishing functional community-level institution responding to different women needs and concerns, and then universal approach to gender responsive or gender inclusive development planning. Thus, SWEM also conducts research studies to promote evidences to inform policies. Thank you, Mamata. Uh, before we begin uh, the presentation, I would like to just give a brief overview of the research that we are going to speak about today. So uh, SWAM, as Mamata uh, talked about, that SWAM does gender sensitization trainings and is very integral as a technical assistant in mainstreaming gender in NRLM system. So in that context, SWAM initiated a qualitative process evaluation in collaboration with Anthropy to generate evidence around uh, interventions that supports the empowerment of women collectives in selective scale-up districts of Odisha and Madhya Pradesh. So the overarching aim of the assessment is to understand the pace of change in knowledge, attitude, and pra practice that follows from the gender sensitization and uh, facilitation measures the program undertakes and identify the indicators of change. Apart from that, we also wanted to know what has been the experience of self-help group members voluntary organization and cluster level federation leaders, when it comes to change and empowerment, what are the factors that affect this change? What do they understand by change and empowerment? Is there a linearity or non-linearity in our respondents' change journey? Or you know, are, are there any typological patterns emerging from a study of individual change journeys? So to answer these questions, because these are very complex things to understand, these are very complex things to unfold as well. So to answer these questions, we adopted for uh, ethnography-based mixed qualitative research methods uh, to trace incre incremental change in women's agency, their confidence, and self-efficacy. 
uh, based in grounded approach. This is a year long study that is actually ongoing at the moment. We are in the middle of it. The data collection is also ongoing. Um, we, uh, uh, informed by ethnography, semi-structured inquiry and design research methods are used in the study. Um, today, we will discuss the key challenges and adaptations in developing frameworks to measure complex outcomes in different social and cultural contexts. As I spoke about that this is uh, uh, being conducted in two different geographies, which is Odisha and Madhya Pradesh. Also to take in consideration in ethical consideration mitigation strategies when it comes to navigating the field. So we are going to discuss these questions in the light of the Swayam program today. Uh, now I would like to request Pratisha to please take us through the m and &E and research process. Thank you. Thank you, Surabhi. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'm Katyusha, and uh, I'm presenting today on behalf of my team from Anthropy. Uh, 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 so uh, this is a study uh, that is being conducted uh, across Madhya Pradesh and Urissa, just like Subhi mentioned. And uh, essentially, uh, it is uh, it uses a mix of methods. Uh, and I'll quickly take you through what the approach and overall methodology was uh, stage by stage. Um, so uh, we, like, she, like so we mentioned, it was a grounded approach for this study. Uh, which is to say that, uh, you know, we really went in, um, you know, with a empty cup and uh, our researchers, uh, four of our researchers, uh, uh, you know, they are also uh, present uh, atten as attendees today. So who are still on the field, uh, it's an ongoing study. So uh, we went in, uh, the methodology basically entails uh, four uh, stages, I would say, um, uh, or four types of uh, uh, three types of, uh, four, sorry, four types of uh, research methods that have been combined. So we went in with uh, uh, some desk research uh, to look at uh, available literature, existing literature, and also to really understand in depth how the program has been implemented in both these geographies. The implementation agencies were different for both the geographies uh, and activities also were quite uh, different. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, we went in uh, with the ethnographic research, uh, which was, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, entry to the field was with ethnographic research. And uh, we went in with some information, of course, from our desk review. Uh, but the idea behind uh, using ethnographic research was to be able to directly, as well as passively observe, uh, more observe, less ask, you know, uh, and to understand the sociocultural context and decipher how is gender faring, what are the gender dynamics, how is culture informing uh, gender dynamics within you know, the, the set context. Now, uh, uh, so in this way, uh, through ethnographic research, it's a, it, it was a very, lo it's a longitudinal phase. Uh, our teams were there for several weeks. Uh, and uh, throughout the, one thing I'd like to mention here that throughout the uh, course of this uh, study, uh, as it is, you know, uh, change in uh, knowledge, attitude, practices uh, around gender that we are trying to understand. And the program is also, you know, it has been recently implemented. It's a nascent program. So uh, presumably, you know, we, we knew that the change would be also uh, very uh, like incremental, like she said, so very little things initially, like gender is hard to change. So in order to understand the nuances of that change, uh, the study was designed to be longitudinal. And uh, we, we are, uh, you know, our sample, although is not very large, as you know, it is not in most qualitative studies. But we have said we are doing several interactions with the same respondents. So some of our key respondents, they're being tracked over a period of time. So it, it's a nearly a two month, two year long study. So throughout this, uh, you know, throughout the course of uh, over a year, a year and a half, uh, you know, we are we are tracking uh, women and uh, how they are kind of embodying the change that the program is uh, uh, sort of uh, trying to implement through its inputs. So in, on the top right corner, you can see the circles of study and observation. So we are looking at uh, all the spheres that uh, sort of comprise a woman's life. 
so what is her family circle uh, the SSG circle you know so women before the SSGs were formed were very uh, constrained to their households uh, by and large so the SSG circle their friends extended family members co-members uh, their friends are non-family friends, uh, their maternal relationships, right? Uh, then also looking at the extended social circle. So which would be acquaintances, their trainers, even SRLM officials. So we are looking at both the supply and the demand side, uh, uh, so to say. And uh, so the ethnographic research was really uh, the way for building the foundation of the study. So after we were able to understand what the sociocultural context is, uh, how gender operates, how people are thinking about gender, uh, what is the existing sort of benchmark, right, for uh, social norms and gender. Uh, based on that, we moved on to the next uh, 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 next uh, method of research, which is to do semi-structured qualitative research. Now uh, we used our ethnographic research, the synthesis of that was able to help us, uh, was able to inform us about what the indicators of knowledge attitude practice shift is. So, uh, you know, even to, to do a semi-structured uh, qualitative research, with what is the questions to be asked? Who should we talk to? How should we go about talking about certain things? Uh, and which specific indicators are we trying, uh, should we track to be able to uh, understand change? So that was informed very, uh, deeply by ethnographic research through ethnographic research um, you know even things like they're different within the same uh, 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 district there are different types of communities there are different social identity groups uh, so uh, how do they interact with each other what are the power dynamics and where is gender nested into all of this so how do we go about what are the questions we ask and since we're working in two different geographies the inquiry the nature of the inquiry the nature of the indicators are also different uh, for each geography. So we were able to develop our tools for the semi-structured uh, study basis, the ethnographic research. And uh, so in the next stage, when we did the semi-structured uh, research, uh, our, we, we narrowed our focus. So ethnographic research was more, uh, you know, it, it was the same method of going in uh, and observing and uh, writing. And also, you know, we'll talk about that a bit later, how to reduce bias. So one of the big things when you do, uh, you know, grounded approach and when you're doing ethnographic work is, you know, how do we keep out the researchers bias uh, from getting mixed up with the data that is coming out. So a lot of measures, a lot of training has gone into doing that and we got very rich data. And uh, now basically after casting a very broad net to understand the context, we narrow our net uh, and we uh, deploy more structured and semi-structured inquiries. Uh, and from this stage onward also, we are able to, uh, we started uh, applying uh, design thinking and design research methods uh, more at the level of analysis, I should say. Uh, the, so we are using our structured inquiry uh, to uh, visual and visualizing that data uh, so that, uh, you know, we can conduct visual analysis of data. So we have been doing things like building service journey maps. Uh, I'll, talk about them in the next slide and uh, also be building change maps so visualizing change for different uh, types of women uh, you know from the time that they became an SSG member or they got married and came to the village till the time till the current time you know and before and after the top the bottom left uh, box you see on the screen so we have mapped pre-intervention and post-intervention what has changed what does change mean so it it looks at uh, familial dynamics, social, cultural, and economic background of a person, personal beliefs, and how they identify themselves. All of this, uh, which came, a lot of it came from the ethnographic phase. Uh, and then also through the structured qualitative, then we started semi-structured qualitative. We, we asked more pointed questions around, you know, what are their achievements and uh, what kind of, uh, how have they been, uh, able to engage with the gender transformative model, right? So the program, that has been implemented for change, how have people uh, been able to uh, interact with them? Because uh, it's essential to understand that, uh, you know, you might have the same uh, training given to a, a host of women, but the way people will engage with it, the way people will absorb it, embody it, perpetuate the training around gender that they're getting, that greatly depends on, you know, what stage, what was their starting point, which was uh, informed by, again, the ethnographic research and the pre-intervention stage. 
um, and uh, right. So, um, and then uh, for uh, like the synthesis, I was saying that we have used design research methods. Uh, we were also, uh, we have also developed uh, a gender analysis matrix. Uh, it was adapted from an existing uh, USAID uh, gender analysis matrix. Uh, so, which allows us to do more structured analysis of the KAP shift, the knowledge attitude practice shift. Uh, and uh, in addition to this, so there are different methods we are using to even synthesize the data. And it's very rich and a lot of data that is coming out uh, from you know, doing such a longitudinal study. Uh, and we have also, uh, we are also beginning to uh, establish patterns and typologies. Uh, so what are the type, we are building typologies around, you know, um, ability of women to gain agency. So what are the different uh, groups? How are we, like we are trying to group women uh, based on, and we're trying to define the determinants that inform how one is able to gain agency uh, and then grouping women basis that. Uh, and uh, this is again uh, for the purpose so that, you know, the program can be further strengthened and inputs can be, uh, further inputs can be more strategic, right? And uh, it was, uh, and because like I said, it's a, it's a longitudinal study and, uh, we have constantly, uh, you know, no part of this uh, research was executed after, you know, the tools being made, say, in the beginning of the study, no. Because it's a rounded approach, we went in to understand the context. Even within that, there were a lot of iterations about what do you watch, what do you observe, uh, you know, what, uh, what kind of biases to address in your own way of observation. So these methods, and then even in the structured, semi-structured qualitative, there have been, there's, we're repeatedly looking at the data, iterating our methods, iterating our tools, uh, uh, and narrowing our focus, uh, you know, broadening, narrowing our focus. So it's an iterative process, um, and uh, it has been a very enriching experience. So uh, in, in brief, this is the approach and the methodology. Um, I'll go on now to explain a little bit what the, rationale of doing this was, uh, so it's uh, hands-on, you know, on the scene learning, and uh, it sort of brings together, uh, you know, the uh, different uh, disciplines to do, the, to do this kind of a method. And uh, we are basically trying to build data from personal and the lived experiences of uh, the people that we are studying. And uh, again, I have, I think, spoken quite a bit about the grounded theory and its data lab concept building and its iterative and a lot of iteration. And uh, it is particularly useful for qualitative context building to understand the baseline and the situation analysis studies. So for that reason, uh, you know, this is the method that we have adapted. Now traditional, and we have also retained aspects of traditional ethnography in the sense uh, you know, such a study where our researchers are there on the field for such a long time uh, and they're living within the village, uh, you know, in the in a uh, rented room uh, in a building that belongs to one of our respondents or such, you know, that is the way that our team is present on the ground. Uh, there has been a lot of um, effort uh, to, uh, you know, give people space to come back to us, to talk to us. So it is really not forced. Uh, and we have taken care of these things uh, in the way our teams were trained, uh, that people should uh, be allowed time to talk to you in their own time. Uh, and again, uh, you know, the, the topic about bias, I'll come back to that also uh, in a bit. So, um, and again, the geographies and samples can appear homogeneous, but ethnographies identify individual communities, track changes with them over a period of time, and identify the individual stimulants within the group and shifting dynamics over long periods of time. Uh, now, uh, in this slide, this is a short uh, or quick glimpse of what a service journey looks like. This is one of the processes, like I said, we were doing, we've been doing change journeys, we are doing, um, you know, the gender analysis matrix, we are doing typologies and patterns. Uh, service journeys is, uh, one of the tools we have used to look at the quality of service delivery. So uh, the program uh, has made uh, services for gender, uh, like uh, gender services, like, uh, you know, uh, for say, women to access help around uh, domestic violence cases, to seek justice around domestic violence cases from the grassroots level. 
uh, there has been a lot of work, a uh, lot of activities, uh, you know, uh, and gender point persons and, uh, uh, you know, have been uh, created in the village. Uh, GCRPs, res gender resource persons have been created in the villages uh, so that people are given knowledge about entitlements uh, and, uh, you know, they, they are given assistance when they try to access schemes and entitlements, right? So the service journey mapping, it's, it's basically quite straightforward cut service design. Uh, what we do here is we look at a person's journey right from the time that they come with an issue to the uh, gender point person or the GCRP uh, that, that the program has trained to do provide such kind of assistance on the ground. And we track this journey uh, you know, through their interaction with several different stakeholders uh, till the point that it is resolved. Right. So uh, by doing such a, again, this is a, uh, you know, this is again a design method applied to data analysis. Uh, and it, this is not an output. It is a mid step. It's an analytical tool. Uh, it allows us to visually see where the challenges are happening. What are the pain points? Where in this journey are there dead ends and the person has to start over again or, you know, go back a few steps. So uh, this is the way that we have been uh, mapping service journeys and it facilitates reportage of facts. It's very, very factual. Uh, it facilitates longitudinal analysis of multiple perspectives and external barriers to extend access, access in gender services. So of course, when you talk about domestic violence, uh, when you talk about entitlements, a lot of external stakeholders are involved, like suppose say the police, or the you know uh, one stop center which is for uh, addressing uh, domestic violence uh, and sexual violence. Um, there are uh, tehsil offices. Uh, there are um, you know revenue office inspectors. Bunch of people involved. You know like the guy who makes the Aadhaar card when you're talking about entitlements and stuff. Uh, so there are many many stakeholders involved. So for every journey we map out who these different stakeholders are, and this helps us to visualize. Where is the blockage? Where is the failure point? And what can the program do to build capacity or you know, what kind of inputs can be created to overcome? So with the help of making many, many such maps, what we do finally is to create a, set, a kind of blueprint, uh, which sort of compiles all these different journeys to show you, okay, this is how the service is supposed to flow. And in, on the ideal service, these are the barriers that come out you know, in that part and that part and that part. So it basically shows you different barriers uh, and how they come up at different parts. Um, and um, lastly, uh, this is uh, this slide is about you know the innovative. So ethnography, of course, uh, you know I'm sure not many of you are unfamiliar with ethnography. Uh, but in uh, anthropy, like my colleague Gayatri, who's here also with us, uh, this was a method that a new approach that uh, you know uh, anthropy developed, uh, and uh, what they did was a variation of the traditional ethnographic method. Uh, so in traditional ethnography, uh, it's usually a solo researcher, a solo ethnographer who goes into the field, uh, spends a long period of time, uh, and you know they really sort of plonk themselves within that context uh, and uh, work with the guide of uh, with a guide or one team leader or so, right? So the risks in doing that would be in mitigating personal bias. So when one person is going, and we see this, this is a challenge for us also, right? Uh, and we see this with our own researchers uh, also still. Uh, but what we have done is uh, mitigating bias in the sense if you spend so much time in the context, a lot of things start to, uh, you know, in the beginning, maybe you think, okay, that is strange or that is noticeable. But slowly, slowly, a lot of things start to seem normal to you that otherwise actually would not be normal to your context where you, the researcher, comes from. So, uh, so and then also, you know, us coming from different contexts, we come with our own biases. So every researcher will have their own bias. And when it is one person, it is difficult to acknowledge these biases and also difficult to sort of track when this person's own identity is sort of dissolving with that of the community that they're spending time in. So both these things. Uh, and also with one person, capturing data for more than 15, 20 respondents is very difficult to do alone because uh, ethnography comes with also a lot of writing. So we see a lot of things, but as long as it's not written, you know, it's, it's not usable data. So what Anthropy has done is developed a buddy system uh, 
and which basically we have teams of two female researchers who have been trained and sensitized and positioned within communities in Orissa and MP. Uh, they are from the same state or at least linguistically they're able to, uh, you know, they belong to the same context, uh, but they work. Uh, so that is one measure that we have taken. Now each team uh, of each state works with a backend team, uh, which is three re-season ethnographers and uh, including a design researcher. Uh, and uh, raw data is constantly processed and, you know, sort of taken apart, questioned, made sense of, and two to three times a week we do that. And again, you know, there is constant guidance given to this team around, okay, what are you really seeing and what of this is, uh, you know, and, and guidance around how to report things factually and how to separate, uh, you know, one's own bias. And uh, that is something, you know, like if you look at our ethnographic writing, uh, it is uh, in, the, in, the, in the ethnographic research time that we did it, you, in one side, you write what is the, what you are seeing as what you are seeing. And then you also write, why are you seeing it the way you are seeing it? You know, where am I coming from as a researcher? If something uh, caught my attention or, you know, is seemingly wrong or, uh, you know, maybe unusual to me, why is it so? So this kind of exercises were done at length, uh, especially during the ethnographic uh, research time. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, two out of three months of intensive data gathering at a time is being done, right? And uh, followed by a break for primary research team and insight-based iterations. So this is the way that, uh, you know, the traditional ethnography was adapted uh, to be more suitable, suited for a process assessment so like such uh, around gender. Uh, I'll stop here. <laughs> this is the end of my slides. Um, Surabhi? Yeah, Over thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you, Patricia, for such an enriching uh, and, you know, kind of trying to compact all of this because the kind of work and the kind of influx of the data you and I and everybody here knows is too much also. So, you know, thank you for situating this research and showcasing what we're trying to accomplish because a lot of times we see that qualitative research, one sort of qualitative research, one kind of qualitative method or analysis is adopted. But here, what we're trying to do is mix a bunch of qualitative research methods as well as qualitative analysis as well, because if you're trying to accomplish, uh, trying to at least attempt to understand what does change really mean, because if somebody asks you today, it will be very difficult for me to also, you know, say what, because empowerment is also a very value-based uh, judgment. What may mean empowering, empowering for me may not be mean empowering for you. So it has been uh, very enriching also to be associated with this study. And, uh, you know, Pratusha, uh, you spoke a lot about uh, the qualitative data that comes in. And, you know, uh, one thing I just want to ask you is that, you know, that there is an influx of data. Lots of influx of data happens when you're doing qualitative work and there are repeated interactions also with the participants. So, uh, you know, how do you uh, sort of uh, organize that data? What has been your process? Like what kind of methods, if we could ref reflect on the KAP and social norms uh, change journey, uh, a bit on that, that uh, how do you situate that data? What is needed? What may not be needed at the time? Because as you go on the field as a researcher, also spend a lot of time on the field, uh, the indicators are also evolving uh, a bit. Uh, the program is also maturing uh, as we go on. So uh, how do you uh, organize that data? Because I think as researchers, it gets very difficult and overwhelming all, all of a sudden to have that. So if you could just reflect a bit on that. Um, like, uh, so in, like I said, the two uh, geographies where the study is happening are very different. And uh, the, the value of doing ethnography was this, that it really helped us to understand the context in depth. Now, uh, see the program's vision is similar for both the geographies, right? We want to see women empowered, gain more agency, uh, report against domestic violence, get access to entitlements. But... Uh, because we were able to understand the context so well, 
uh, I mean, see, we can never really fully, completely, 100% un understand the context. Maybe we understood 60 or 70% of the context, you know, despite doing all this in-depth stuff. Um, we were able to first, you know, appreciate what is the local culture, uh, what does gender mean there, you know, in the two different contexts, uh, in the two different geography. And uh, what is the, so what the benchmark for change, like the, the issues that people uh, pick up from the program and sort of, uh, you know, that really sit with people, those are also different from place to place, right? So for instance, in uh, Odisha, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, collectivism that is seen from uh, around livelihood. Huh? And when it comes to domestic violence, we are also seeing uh, there is collectivism when it comes to cases of minors or child marriage, you know, or a POXO case. We really see like the community, uh, the, uh, the gender carders, the SHG women, police, da, 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 et cetera, you know, everyone really come together uh, because that is something, uh, you know, it, it, Odisha has come a longer way perhaps than Madhya Pradesh. If you, if you talk about, you know, that, that practice of child marriage, uh, people are more, women are more educated also, you know, in Odisha, in, in the, in the Ogar district where we are there. Uh, so, you know, from education, better access to livelihood also, the, the OLM has been, uh, you know, doing great work in terms of livelihood, the work is quite fantastic. Uh, almost every woman in the village has, you know, been able to take loans or, you know, any, anybody who's joined the SSG has reported benefits that they have been able to avail when it comes to livelihood from the SSGs. So in that way, in Odisha, you know, uh, the you see what I mean? The benchmark is different. Now in Madhya Pradesh, uh, the saturation of the SSGs is also lower in the district that we are in. Uh, there are a lot of people, women who are still outside of those circles uh, and uh, there, uh, you know, what we were able to establish from the ethnography uh, and uh, is, uh, you know, there is this very transactional nature of uh, treating women, like women are commodified, I might even say. Uh, and uh, when you, whenever we are seeing a domestic violence case, and there is a lot of collectivism around, uh, you know, domestic violence and women wanting to separate, but it is coming from a place of not, oh, like that I was physically violated, but that now there is land rights for women that is grouped up with that. So, you know, you are wanting to separate because you know now that you can have your own piece of land. And then there are cultural practices like uh, have men bringing in second and third and fourth wives. That was, you know, an accepted norm in that community. Now, those are things women are starting to speak up against, which is again, not the same thing that we see in Urissa. So the indicators, so exactly like I was saying, what do you look at is very different in both the districts that we were able to identify from the ethnography. And in this way, uh, our structures for analysis have been informed also, and our structures for inquiry, for the structured inquiry also have been informed because the indicators that we are looking at in both the states are also quite different. So uh, it, it is tough, uh, you know, from so much data to sort of put it into tables and, uh, you know, we are working tirelessly almost every week, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, th this has been uh, the way we have gone about it from uh, unstructured to semi-structured uh, research and then to very structured uh, analysis uh, using methods of design research, uh, using methods like the you know, structured qualitative analysis, right? All right. Thank you uh, so much, Pratisha, for you know, shedding light on this because I feel that you talked about context. And I think contexts are very important. Contexts are different in both the geographies that we're studying, but context also uh, shaped the outcome of the program or the intervention of the program as well, as you said, but the same thing could be dealt in different uh, geographies differently or understood very differently when it comes to collectivization and uh, uh, you know, domestic violence. I feel that, you know, uh, I am very proud of the study. So I feel that the standardized uh, MNE framework may not be able to capture the complexity of individual lives, which the mixed qualitative methods that we're trying to attempt has been able to at least 
uh, maybe understand a bit of it. So, uh, you know, Satisha, I think uh, I'll give you a breather here a bit. Uh, we have one question more, but I'll come to Mamita actually. So, uh, you know, Mamita, you spoke about Swayam's program. It's the coalition of research and implementation. It's a unique design, definitely, which uses evidence-based empowerment approaches. Um, coming together of m and &E and program management is also very crucial when we talk about implementation of social programs. And uh, while it does dramatically inform the program with evidence of what works and what does not, we also understand that there are challenges pertaining to inclusivity and adaptability of this evidence. Uh, my question is that, that when we measure complex outcomes, such as, as Pratisha spoke about, you know, pace of change in attitude, beliefs, uh, so social norms, then, uh, you know, how do you make m &E inclusive and adaptive? Inclusive, uh, not only for the, uh, not only for the uh, project implementators, but people, like, inclusive for people who are designing the project or inclusive for the beneficiaries of the project. So the evidence work both ways. I feel there has to be a tandem. So how do we make that tandem with the program implementers? Thanks, Survi. We all know that this is a very complex question to respond to. There is no one size fits all for this question. But what we have been able to achieve through this program, I'll just narrate it, but long way to go. But we have just embarked on that journey. Let me give you a brief of that. So the field findings have to be representative enough to draw a body of evidence as to reflect what works and what does not work. In other words, the field testimonies uh, reflect enablers and barriers. Now, these anecdotal evidences are critical input while uh, designing uh, policy papers, government advisories that basically been published from the center and go reach out to the state as to how to do, where to push and nudge and exactly what to achieve. So those are basically a broad contour of the pathways of where, from where to start, how to achieve and how, who are the stakeholders who have to be involved in this process? Now, setting that as the benchmark, these research studies generally brings out reflections and perspective of several stakeholders who are involved directly or indirectly in the program implementation. So in a way, this rich evidences till date has helped us in providing useful recommendations ranging from content development of knowledge pieces for capacity building of staff and cadres, because Pratyusha has already spoken about the demand and supply side, we really need to standardize these processes. And what do we mean by exactly when we talk about gender mainstreaming, gender integration? So there has to be a standardized process of building these knowledge pieces for developing the capacities who are involved in the program implementation. Um, then, of course, it talks about pedagogies also. Several interaction has revealed that what are some of the pedagogies that we need to involve. It is not always the audiovisuals, but also bringing case studies from the states because the lived experiences are testimonies to which each uh, trainees would relate to that cases very easily and come out with a solution which is very much geographical, uh, socio cultural context specific. Also identifying three key areas for strengthening collective action. One, of course, which is coming out from uh, the study that Pratyusha reflected is, where do we build the convergence? When we are talking about gender-based violence and we have an institution, so how do we bring police? How do we bring legal services? And where do we start the negotiation? Should we start the negotiation at the subnational level or should we, should we draw a more overarching contour and have start the discussion at the national level. So I think these are rich outputs which are draining into the program and there has been a growing ownership of these reflections from these studies because these studies will not only does not only capture the realities but it also captures the voices from the field, the perceptions, the challenges and I think those are lived realities. And now slowly the government is also accepting to the fact that what would be a more enabling factor, what could be a more conducive factor to kind of push the program, which actually strengthens women's citizenship 
within the livelihoods mission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mamata, for reflecting because I feel a lot of time we get lost in evidence and then we don't think of uh, the program that how tangible the actions are, which can be actually replicated on the field and how achievable they are also. So I think that connection is very, very uh, much needed also uh, to be embedded in the program. So thank you so much for reflecting on that. Pratisha, my final question, and I think you have spoken a bit about it already, is on ethics. Um, so I will not let you go without answering that question for me, is that, you know, uh, you spoke about that ethnographers, uh, ethnography do, do, does place as a researcher at the center of all actions, and um, you live with the community, and in your case, in one of the beneficiaries' home, as you spoke about. So, you know, uh, but here we are trying to understand gender, but, and, but home is also a very private and intimate space. So gender is contested every day. Some battles are won, some are lost. We all know that. But when you explore a complex uh, thing like that and you live with the community in, in their own intimate space, what kind of ethical measurements and mitigation strategies you adopted? You spoke about it, but I want to know, you know, how did you train your researchers to navigate in the field, especially when they're living, uh, while they maintain the privacy of the participants also? Because uh, it should not. Uh, because sometimes, if you know that the person is, uh, you know, observing me, things should not become performance. When do you? Blur, there is a blurry line between performance and reality when a person knows that they're being observed. So, how do you mitigate that? What kind of training does the te team receive on that front? Right. Uh, this was, in fact, uh, the very first concern for Anthropy. I think when we were starting such a project uh, Gayatri, the founder, uh, you know, who conceptualized this uh, model, uh, came up with a very interesting and multidisciplinary inception workshop uh, that we did. And uh, what it entailed was, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. Uh, so uh, we used participatory activities to familiarize uh, our participants, you know, which would be uh, some of them would be, were to be our future uh, field researchers, uh, and we ourselves were also involved. Uh, and we familiarize them to uh, predominantly around the topics of bias, empathy, uh, and gender. Okay, so these three things. We had a five-day workshop to just understand bias, to understand empathy, and to understand gender. Uh, and the activities of this workshop were designed to basically enable self-reflection among the participants. Now, what that means is, you know, we, every human being has their own bias. You know, everybody has uh, different levels of empathy to different uh, topics or subjects based on our own personal life experiences, you know, and all that. Uh, gender is also, you know, again, as uh, all of us, the, most of the participants are women. Uh, the, our researchers are all women. Uh, we have all had our own experiences around gender and some form of discrimination everybody has uh, experienced. But uh, when you go to a different setup, a different context, different culture, uh, it can be very different from what you have experienced in your own life. So to enable this kind of, you know, understanding, empathy, to be able to acknowledge your own bias, uh, you know, Anthropy did a very fun and interesting five day long workshop. So, and it, rather than taking a, you know, very top down instructor facilitator approach, um, the workshop was designed to be very interactive and collaborative. And uh, the module integrated, uh, you know, we it drew, it, it integrated theatrical exercises, uh, plays, uh, participant and direct observation exercises. You know, we sent our researchers, ki, jao, get out in Delhi, uh, you know, go to that, uh, area and this area and you know observe random people on the road pick a subject so you know we we really made them go through it uh and uh yeah so this kind of uh introductory sessions were held around empathy and also the uh, you know for uh, design thinking so how do you uh look at any issue with a problem solving mindset you know even that because one of the outputs uh, of the project is also to provide recommendations for the program right so we did all of this in five days uh and um, 
yeah it uh, it it uh, you know it, it drew from applied theater from design thinking uh, semiotics also uh, you know how do you decipher signs and symbols and visually understand uh, you know <laughs> the context and people right uh, and uh, and and traditional ethnography of course so it it drew from these four disciplines of applied theater design thinking semiotics and traditional ethnography so this is a workshop that we did uh, you know and uh, we also have uh, of course the standard thing of you know maintaining privacy and confidentiality of data uh, and all that was also of course covered uh, and uh, great care has to be taken around that and uh, i think our team's been doing that pretty well um, another thing about ethics here is also like you know when you send out a young team to be on the field for so long uh, um, efforts have also been made for the well-being of that team so uh, anthropy also brought in uh, uh, a collective of uh, you know uh, uh, of uh, mental health and uh, counselors uh, who have a direct who the team have a direct line with uh to be able to talk to and reach out to because it can be quite isolating sometimes to be there uh and uh, you know a lot of issues can come from doing such a longitudinal stay uh and yes and also for trauma informed therapy you know when you're working around these kind of sensitive issues with you know listening or you know recording a case of domestic violence and such and you know so uh, to be able to deal with their own um uh, trauma of doing this kind of work that is also something that anthropy set up uh, which has been quite helpful yeah. uh thank you so much patricia for shedding light because i feel it's very important yeah. because uh when the trauma triggers emotions you don't know so it's very important because dealing with issues of domestic violence at the field and then also associating with women and uh having a personal relationship because you're on the field so it does have an, a very bad effect and isolating as you rightly pointed out so kudos to anthropy really for you know focusing on that aspect as well um you know uh, that we have a couple of questions pratisha i see that you have uh, already answered a few of them but uh, one of the question from ragini is that uh, when we surbi use... can i just get 5 seconds please Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, there is another question by Janat Mamita. You and I probably can take that. It's on how do you do advocacy with government where numbers are usually important based on qualitative data. So, uh, so uh, there is no fixed response to this answer uh, to this question. But what our experience have been is. to achieve data you have to set your actions online so what are your actions so even if it is in the form of what i say it as policy paper government advisories developing capacities of the staff creating curated knowledge products giving a direction to a particular intervention which helps in universal approach to gender responsive planning or processes across the sub national architecture we really need to adopt to a very streamlined process so uh initially the first initial discussions will not be very uh, will not be very comfortable but yes with time when reflections from across the geographies echoes the same issues and challenges then there is an acceptance and ownership of the fact that we really need to meander our processes our systems so that it is in place to address some of these issues so one of the major issue is talking about convergence we really need to when we see to address gender issues and those issues which has to be addressed by the community women or community champions we need to provide them a very safe guarded environment so when they go back to their private space they do not fall into the trap so what could be some of the ways and methods in which institutions can do their work institutions are protected and there is a larger community consciousness and engagement towards these processes so one is of course there is a bigger discussion there is a 
there is an ownership of how do we converge resources, particularly with the three, four areas like with health, WCD, women and child development, with legal services, police, to at least give them some kind of protection and find ways and means to make these institutions sustainable and continue to do the work, the, what they are expected to do. Okay, uh, I think I also will take a bit, uh, add my inputs here because I think Janat asked the question about qualitative data. So, you know, Janat, as Vamata said that uh, there has been, there will be uncomfortable uh, discussions as well, but uh, by the end of it, I feel that uh, in our uh, work, especially that there is a cohesion when we work with the government and we have implementation partners also on the field who are very active and have a very good relationship working with the government also. So, you know, uh, a lot of ownership also comes from that, from, from all the important stakeholders. And uh, now with this, with this study, uh, particularly, we also have these regular workshops, learning workshops that are done in collaboration with the government, the implementation partners, and the first workshop also included the participants, the beneficiaries from the field as well. So, you know, uh, that of course, in the first initial uh, conversations, we had to explain a lot what is ethnography, why ethnography is needed, and why it is needed at this point in time in the SWAYAM program, because we are doing quantitative work as well. It's not that we're not doing, but we are also accommodating qualitative work, and why qualitative work is important is a rationale that we have to keep on giving uh, also. So, you know, so we are also prepared with that mind when we are working and because we know that we can show some important recommendations or bring some actionable points as Pratyusha said. So we, these are the conversations that are simultaneously happening with the government, the implementation partners and the research agency and the, the Swayam program. So it's a bringing together of all of that, which is, I think, is making it work and uh, probably a good success, you know. Sorry. Yeah. Muted. Yes, sorry. Muted, sir. I muted. Uh, so uh, Ragini has asked a question, Pratisha, that when you use anecdotal evidence to identify pathways, you could be looking at positive deviance. How do you universalize deviance? Right. Uh, for uh, yes, when we are building pathways, uh, we are you know, going uh, like we are, we really try to capture what is actually happening. Uh, and uh, you, you can't, I mean, see, we have not defined here that we are looking at. Uh, so our different analysis methods are giving us different outputs. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when we are doing service journeys, uh, uh, we are looking at, uh, the role that has been defined for these uh, gender resource persons, right? They are supposed to assist uh, women in a certain way uh, that they have been trained to a certain degree. Like for instance, uh, a domestic violence case, uh, you know, you are help, you're supposed to help them report it to the one-stop center or to call the helpline. Uh, but then after that, uh, what happens if a case goes to court, she loses visibility and her role is only till then. So uh, we can, we are looking at how well are people, our cadres able to uh, fulfill their roles, right? How well are they able to do what is prescribed for them to do? And yes, we have also found that sometimes the limitation of the role is sometimes frustrating people that, you know, that, uh, I have only been able to do so much. No violence still continues for this case. I cannot do more. Uh, so these kind of things we are finding, but essentially what service design mapping is allowing, service maps are allowing us to do are to identify barriers. Wow. And uh, so far we have, uh, we have got uh, suggestions or, you know, maybe people have expressed that, oh, I wish there was something more to do. I want to do something more, but I don't know what else. Uh, but we haven't really seen uh, positive deviance that one is going out of the way, uh, you know, to help. And, and that is all right. That is not what is expected of them. Uh, we see, uh, and, and 
see there is when it comes to gender you you can see positive deviance maybe when it comes to health practices uh you know uh but in gender like i said the starting point for every person is only very different uh you can have the training given to a cohort of women but like uh, which is why we were doing the this is what the change journey maps are informing us what are the predispose predisposing conditions of people uh that is enabling them to engage with the training content and take it forward right uh so different women have different uh, capacities are engaging with the program at different capacities uh, cardo women um uh, and uh, you know like depending on what kind of gender norms are there in your own household uh depending on how much say support you have in your own household or depending on how much mobility you have uh so all these factors determine you know how they are able to uh, engage with the program and one of the key things or the main thing that this assessment is supposed to look at is how is the gender training percolating into the community as in the training is given to a certain uh, cadre of women right then from then from them is it going into their uh, you know family members from there is it going further on to their friends and acquaintances uh from there is it going on to people who are not part of the sgs also you know who are maybe and those are the more most vulnerable people right that they are not even part of the sgs so we are looking at all of these things uh and uh, we haven't really looked at it as positive deviants or negative deviants uh it's it's really looking at what is actually happening and we are trying to assess factors for why what is happening uh thanks pratisha for shedding light on the knowledge transfer because that is very important because the training does not is limited to sg women they do go out and they do talk to within their families also and they are also trying to understand with the study that you know there are many modules of trainings also there are many topics that is being covered in these trainings so what does what sticks what does not stick uh in retaining that information and why does not it stick so these are the these are all also the questions that the research team is also exploring at the point i I'd think like we, add one yeah. thing uh, that the way the program uh, way the training was implemented in both the states was quite different uh the the implementation that happened in madhya pradesh was very creative uh you know they use theater uh, they use this kind of interactive activities and uh, you know demonstrative activities so the stickiness of that messaging we see in madhya pradesh is much more even though the outreach is not as wide as it was in odisha you know in odisha uh, the, the 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 methods are more straightforward Uh, but there is more impetus on sort of pushing it into the community pushing it and the the women that are engaged like i said there is higher saturation of the self help groups itself also in odisha uh but you see like you know here there is more quantity of coverage but the stickiness of the messaging we are finding so we are also looking at that you know what you know what kind of messaging sticks what kind of messaging trickles down uh and uh, both from the supply side and the demand side like i said yeah okay thanks pratisha i think there's a last question i would like to ask is uh, from an anonymous attendee there's no name so i'll just uh, read out the question um i'm curious if you found considerable difference between the training content and or training delivery process in np and odisha sorry can you repeat that um if you found considerable differences between the training content or training delivery process in mp and odisha yeah certainly hmm. um it it is different i think i partially just answered that yeah yeah in odisha there is more of an effort to um uh, spread awareness about um you know what and and sort of create linkages to uh facilities that are already being provided from the government uh mm -hmm. like you have your one stop centers uh and the 181 helpline uh you know and uh, so even for entitlements you know there are there are already existing schemes and things that that need uh you know more awareness generated in the community so that people can demand for those services right mm -hmm. uh 
and uh, the information dissemination also has been you know very straightforward but in madhya pradesh like i said uh, you know there is lot of uh, the gender sensitization bit in madhya pradesh uh, was done in a very innovative way uh, mm. you know in a very uh, inclusive and uh, simplified way in that way also uh, mm. and therefore uh, we find uh, like i said that and and again the context is also different so therefore the focus of the program uh, in both the areas were also different uh, like the the overall vision is the same but the you know which issues the program is focusing on that was also different like in madhya pradesh there is more focus on uh, you know uh, women asking for land rights right mm. ownership of land if you if your husband separates or you know brings in a second wife or if you are widowed so awareness around that uh, you know they that has been given more focus and uh, that indirectly is encouraging women to even speak up about domestic violence mm -hmm. like i said uh, so yeah the way the implement the 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 overall mission and vision is perhaps the same is the same but the areas of focus are in a way contextualized to the needs of those communities uh, which we are seeing in mp you know it's it's uh, it was done very well uh, in a very creative way uh, mm. but the reach is less but in in orissa we are seeing the reach is far more uh, even okay. though the methods are straightforward all right uh, thank you so much pratisha we are very very right on time uh, as i think uh, this is the end we don't have any questions further but um, as closing i would like to talk up uh, like just mention about that you know we talked about culture and we talked about context spe specific evaluations in in the research but uh, a concentrated effort cannot be fulfilled without collaboration it's it is a collaborative effort uh, it's a collaborative effort with the technical assistance research organizations government um and implementation partners so this project that we are doing the research that we are doing has not been possible without you know the support from mpsrlm uh, mission shakti to disa pci who are actually there all every step of the process because we can't evaluate outcomes if we do not understand the inputs that the program is also giving in so i think the collaborative effort is where we uh, where we are there but one thing i would like to say because you know we are discussing we use mixed bag mixed bag of qualitative methods and we are engaging with the field to really learn about the context contextual complexities and realities uh, we must also address i feel you know the urgency of the challenge in strengthening the evidence based on decision making which require a, even more coordinated effort than before um, we are reimagining ways of working the way we are talking about research merging resources skills um, which are unique to and to jointly contribute but you know collaboration and inclusivity of uh, not just mne implementation partners and program management but also the voices from the field because uh, those are the most affected by the policy interventions and the things that we are talking about so i feel that a concentrated effort is needed in bringing a more diverse set of stakeholders which the studies and so on is trying to attempt uh to the table in developing a partnership and co-creating something that is sustainable so i think um i would end up here and thank you to both the panelists for giving us that time and uh, you know speak to the audience who are still there so many of them <laughs> so i think this has been a great success so thank you everyone for joining thank you everybody for listening and asking the questions and all the field team of anthropy that is there in the audience it wouldn't have been possible this discussion wouldn't have been possible with the amount of writing and data you got for us anushree lopa shaheen and mamita and sudhir so thank you everyone the ivesh team who is there continuously <laughs> so thank you guys and thank you so much i think we'll close now thank you thank you